and of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Today I would just like to um, highlight a few things with you of what I've noticed in the Christian world, not so much amongst our parish, but other parishes of orthodoxy and others who call themselves Christian. One of the things that we as Christians always seek is holiness, obviously. That's why we become Christians, to be purged of all the unrighteousness that dwells in us and to be made whole, holy. Well, this is a, a strange thing because what many do is they do a certain number of exercises, if you like the word, name of that word, certain things, and then they walk around thinking now that they are clean and holy. For example, they might even come to confession and confess some sins. The priest reads the prayers of absolution and reconciliation. The person walks away feeling that they are somehow righteous now and pure. Well, that's not so. It's just not so. St. Paul in one of his letters writes that even the saints are barely saved. If he writes that about saints, what is that to us? This idea of purity, especially whilst we are in the flesh, is something that you really have to purge out of your thoughts because it just doesn't exist. We cannot, just by our thoughts and a few little exercises, consider ourselves to be pure and holy. All we can do at this stage is to strive to fix up that which is shown to us to be defects in our souls, in our bodies, in our spirits. And that's what we work on. We have hope and faith that God's mercy will make up for what we lack. And we lack a lot. We lack a lot. The epistle reading that we heard today is extremely important. I almost was wanting what I do to read it again because it's a paragraph which summarizes spiritual life and how to go about it. Something that I find people, especially outside orthodoxy, have no idea what it is. They think spiritual life is having a religion, believing in something. That's not spiritual life. Spiritual life is what was read before, that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against the spirits of wickedness in high places. Spirits of wickedness that have been allowed to rule this fallen world. Spirits of darkness, the demons, and all the various thoughts and feelings which crowd into us inspire us to commit transgression, knowingly or unknowingly. Usually unknowingly, because we are so backward in our understanding about how the soul and the spirit works, that we don't even see the sort of things that we do, which is not God-pleasing. And this idea of spiritual life is absolutely essential for us to have progress towards salvation. Those who have really progressed a lot, like the saints that we have here and the martyrs, did that work at great struggle. Whenever anybody struggles spiritually, God's grace comes to the help. You know, people say, oh, uh, works don't save you. That we can't be saved just by our works. No, we can't. But if we don't work, God's grace doesn't come to help us either. Because he does not interfere with our free will. And that is the biggest stumbling block for too many. They take things out of context, out of scripture, zero in on a particular sentence and think that that's it. I believe, therefore I'm saved, or I'll do this and I'm saved, or I do this and I'm pure. Well, nobody can be pure because we all await the great judgment anyway. Anyone who reposes, who dies, has to still go through the great judgment. If they're pure, there'd be no great judgment for them. That's... Um, a fact. Nobody can deny the great judgment that comes after the resurrection of the dead. Therefore, nobody, the only person that has obtained 
that sort of uh, infinite salvation is the mother of God. But once again, on account of her struggles, her spiritual struggles, from an early age, when she was brought into the temple, like we commemorated last week, at age three, and with the assistance of Archangel Gabriel, began exactly that sort of struggle that was read in the epistle today, fighting against the powers of the air, the demonic realm, all those that influence our various thoughts and feelings, and which we have to be very careful about what we choose and what we don't choose. Rarely any of us see God's will in this, very rarely. We sort of hit and miss, we take a chance, we think this might be the right path to go. And it might be working out okay, but was it God's will? We don't know. We don't really know. God allows a lot of things to happen in this world. It doesn't mean it's his will. It doesn't mean that's what he really wants. But out of his mercy, he allows things for people who have the right attitude, have the right understanding to somehow dodge through these powers of wickedness that surround us and obtain salvation in the end. One of the other points that I wanted to make that we came across this week, which was rather distressing because it happened within our own archdiocese, um, particular talk was given, supposedly a sermon, by a layperson during liturgy. I'm not going to mention any names or anything like this. It essentially focused on St. Nicholas, whom we're going to be commemorating next Thursday. St. Nicholas is commemorated a few weeks before Nativity for various good reasons, various good reasons. He is the, the saint, the saint that tells us who Christ is. So much so that when various heresies arose in the early centuries, most of them focused on finding out who Christ was. <coughs> was he a man? Was he God? Or what was he? And one of the heresies that arose from one of the priests that was later ba bashed, banished was that Christ was not God, but some sort of special person. A council was held, the first ecumenical council about that in Nicaea. And this particular person, whose name was Arius, continued to harp on these um, wrong teachings. So much so that St. Nicholas, who was also one of the bishops that attended, slapped him. Slapped him. He slapped him. To this day, he stands as the slapper of everything that is contrary to the understanding of who Christ is. Many people believe that Christ is not God. Slap. That's not true. Many believe that he's not a man either. Slap. Some believe that he doesn't have a human will. Slap again. Or that he has a, a divine will, but it overshadows the human will. Slap again. There's a whole body called the um, cops that believe that. <laughs> that the divine will that God has, that Christ has, overshadows the human will that he has. Slap. If St. Nicholas was there, he would slap. That he was born with some sort of immaculate flesh. Slap. No one was being born with immaculate flesh. Nobody. Whilst we're here in the fallen state, both the mother of God and Christ were born with the same flesh that we have. Flesh which is the consequence of Adam's unrepented fall. It was only when Christ resurrected and showed the new body that we will all have, that is indeed immaculate, that cannot transgress, that we are waiting for that. But other than that, Christ is totally, totally human, and at the same time, totally divine. And that is the great providence of our salvation, as Saint Athanasius the Great, who gave us the New Testament, says. 
God became a man in order for us to become God's by grace. Such a great and incomprehensible thing that has been given out of love. Can you imagine that? Until Christ became the Logos, the second person of the Holy Trinity, became a man, nobody knew who God was. You know, who is he? Never seen him, never talked to him, never um, experienced him, unknown, unseen, um, untouchable, incomprehensible, and all of a sudden he appears as a man, as a human being, just like you and I, whom we know, and forever and ever. Our God is a man forever. And that's so important to understand because our spiritual life rests on correct understanding of that. If you get one thing wrong in that, if you attach something to Christ, whether it's about his soul or his will or anything like that, that is contrary to human, you are in a heresy, in some sort of heretical thing. And there are numerous ones. Whole groups of people calling themselves Christians who have got that thing so wrong and that will take you down a very wrong spiritual path. Not the sort of path that was read from the epistle today, but a very different one. One that is not going to heal you. One that is not going to fix up your soul. It's not going to help you win the kingdom of heaven. And indeed we do win it. Because without the pain of that struggle, one gets nowhere. God gave us salvation freely. He opened up that path freely. We did nothing in that um, providence to do to help in that. But he expects us to take it up and struggle for that that he's given us freely. And he comes down very greatly on those who sincerely start, start to do that struggle. That's what these saints that we see around us declare to us from their lives. Some through martyrdom, some through very great ascetic strugglers like St. Mary of Egypt, 40 years in the desert with a loaf of bread, and others of various stages have attained that which we seek. The fixing up of that fallen flesh that we have, which is supposed to be not something negative, but something very high. Even the angels, using the word um, in human terms, envious of us that we have flesh, because they do not. We have the soul and we have the spirit as well. The pinnacle of creation. And Christ brought that pinnacle of creation to us and showed us how it should be in life, in eternity, and what we need to be doing here whilst we're still in the flesh, in the fallen flesh, in order to strive to gain that in our life. Therefore, the other thing about this thing that we heard um, this week about St. Nicholas and the gifts that are presented during the Nativity. I've said this to you before, the gifts of the Nativity are from the Magi who came and venerated the newborn babe several months after he was born, bringing gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The gold being the only gift that's actually worthy of God and the Lord, the most precious metal. The frankincense, the sweetness of virtue that Christ gives and expects us to have and the myrrh, the struggle and the um, way that people go through death in order to obtain resurrection. I've said to you before that when Adam was cast out of paradise, the Lord gave them those gold, frankincense and myrrh as a consolation. So he would remember those days, that time that he had in paradise. That was kept in the Old Testament. Noah took that, kept it on the ark in the floods, built an altar in the middle of the flood and kept it there with the bones of Adam. These were then given to young Melchizedek who took it to the future Golgotha and built a, a sanctuary there. 
until the um, Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and stole those gifts, leaving Adam's bones still buried there, which were washed by the Christ cross when he was crucified. The Babylonians, of course, being the um, nation from which their magi arose, understood many of these things from prophecy and brought those gifts back to the young Christ. Today they're in Mount Athos. Anyone who's been to Mount Athos at the monastery, which monastery is it? St. Paul. St. Paul's. Always they bring it out for the pilgrims to venerate. The gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh. Probably the only holy thing that we have that goes back all the way to the creation of the world because the flood wiped out everything else. But that was preserved, including Adam's bones. There is this incredible history of Christianity, which is not, not in the Bible as such, but it's in holy tradition because the St. John writes, we can't uh, put everything into uh, text because all the books in the world wouldn't contain it. But from holy tradition, we know all these details, and I only gave you a bit of a sketch about it. It's up to you to find out the other details about the fascinating life, not only of the Old Testament, but much of the New Testament, especially about the Mother of God. God help us in this struggle. Next week, um, St. Nicholas commemorated on a Friday or Saturday, I think, and we'll have the service on that Sunday for him, um, being the one who tells us who Christ is, so when he is born, we know that we have a God, man, with us for all of eternity to save us. Let us say.